So people should be able to start joining now and they're coming in. All right. Can the people see me now? Yes, they can see us, yeah. Okay. As hello. they're coming in. Which is so why I turned my camera off. <laughs> That's fine. So hello everyone. Welcome. <laughs> We're just giving you guys a few minutes to join. Uh, it's about five till now, so we'll give people a little more time to hop on here. All right, and I'm I'm Chris. I'll be the presenter today. And so while we're waiting, I'm gonna go ahead and turn on a little music. Why don't I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Today is bound to be one of the most beautiful days in history. I got my sneakers on, shuffling through the neighborhood. No stopping me. My back to the clouds, my face to the sun. Today's the day something's gonna happen.
So we are just going to give it a few more moments to let people continue to join in the numbers once noon hits star skyrocketing a little bit. So we are going to give them a little more time. All right. <clears throat> just a few more moments, everyone. And we'll get started. Thank you for coming out today. It's great to see you, though I don't see you, but it's great to spend some time with you to talk about mindset. We'll be getting started in just a few moments. So bear with us. One day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slaves, will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. One day, one day, one day. Getting started in just a few moments, people. We're waiting for everyone to show up. Thanks for your patience. If everybody is ready to get started, I just want to say thank you from the Ohio Chamber to Chris and Stephen from Next Level Training for joining us today and thank all of you for attending. I think it's going to be a really incredible webinar. Uh, just so you guys know, Next Level Training, their professional development training is transitioning to blue sky. So if you are looking for them in the future, that is what you will find them under. Uh, Chris, if you want to get started. Sure thing. Thank you so much and uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, presentation. We're going to be talking about mindset. And so a uh, little by way of introduction, my name's again, Chris Hawker, and I live here in Columbus, Ohio. I'm, uh, I'm married, I got an 11 year old son, and um, I'm a, one of the co-founders of Next Level Trainings here in Columbus. We're a leadership development training center, and I'm also a life, lifelong entrepreneur in addition to being a trainer and leadership developer. I'm a professional inventor. I've got a company based in Columbus here called Trident Invents. We help inventors license uh, inventions. I'm a professional inventor myself. I've invented things like the Power Squid, which is a, a power strip with little extension cords that I license to Stanley and Phillips and uh, GE, and then they sell them. And uh, I collect royalties. And so I've brought about 100 inventions to market and uh, help and some of my own, some of them working with other inventors to develop their own things. So that's my background as an entrepreneur and, and business person, in addition to being, and I still do that today, in, in addition to being a leadership development and, and trainer. And so we uh, at Next Level Trainings, and as, as she mentioned, we're going to be shifting over to Blue Sky Trainings for our corporate work. Uh, we use mindset to support people in shifting their results. Our, our mindset is the operating system that we used to that we use to navigate our realities that we use to uh, create everything that we are creating in our in our worlds and is a super important tool that many people may not have a super clear understanding of how it works how it actually leads to creating our results and how you can shift it or how you can use it to your advantage we may have heard that you know, you know, high level athletes are, you know, we use mindset or mindset coaching to achieve their high level results <clears throat> without ourselves necessarily being aware. Well, how do they do that? What does that really look like? Or how does one do that? So 
Today, what I'm going to be doing is giving you an introduction to mindset and how it works and how it's involved in, in creating our results in our lives. And then we'll do a, a couple of exercises that are designed to support you in shifting your mindset to seeing some ways in which you can actually uh, create new results in your life by using this tool. So first of all, uh, the, the, the purpose of all the work we're doing here is to shift our results. That's the bottom line of what we're up to is shifting our results. I don't know why that pops off screen. There it is. Oh, it's, it won't stay for me. Please stay. There it is. Results. The, the bottom line of what the work we're up to here is about shifting our results in our lives or in our businesses. If you're here, you're probably a business owner or deeply invested or involved in running a business. And so this isn't just, you know, mindset's not just about feeling good, though that's one of the effects or one of the things that will support in shifting our results. But ultimately, it's about creating new results, about creating something that isn't already happening. So it could, in our personal lives, typically we're looking at health, wealth, and happiness. How do I uh, shift my health and my body? Um, how do I lose weight and keep it off? Or how do I get ready for a triathlon and complete a triathlon or achieve some other momentous and challenging uh, physical achievement? Or how do I reclaim my health from an illness or a disease or an accident or some other kind of setback in my health, right? So we want to shift our health results or our wealth results, right? Like, <laughs> If you're out there, raise your hand. I know I can't see you, but raise your hand if you want to make more money or you want your business to make more money and uh, or you'd like more profit, you'd like more revenue, you'd like your business to grow. And most people, most businesses in their lives find themselves at a status quo level of success. And that status quo typically is like a, a comfort level that's stuck around for a long time. And the, you know, people typically get stuck in a certain level of success, a certain level of wealth. You don't, you know, and occasionally hear about people skyrocketing, but most people find their spot and stay there and, and get stuck and often frustrated with how do I break out of this spot into that next level? So that's uh, wealth. And then lastly, happiness. How do we create more fulfillment and well-being in life? And we say happiness, but it's really a, a more complicated thing than just having positive emotions. It's like, are you feeling fulfilled? Do you have positive relationships in your life? Do you have positive achievement in your life? Are you experiencing what we call 360 degree success in your life? These are all results. And if we look at our lives and at our businesses, we'll identify areas that are working, areas that aren't working, or areas where there's a higher possibility. Now, if you wanna change your results, you got to understand where your results come from. And this may seem obvious, but our results come from our actions. And uh, I say it, you know, may seem obvious, but a lot of people uh, want to see a change, but aren't willing to make a change, right? But if you're going to want, if you want to see something new, you're going to have to do something new. And so our actions create our results. And the, the challenge is for a lot of people is people think they're in charge of themselves, but studies show that actually a human being is only in charge of about 5% of what we're doing day by day, 95% of what we do is habit. It's a pattern. We're creatures of patterns and we do the same things time after time. Our day is our pattern. We wake up, we go through our morning routine. It's a pattern. After our morning routine, we do whatever we do in the mornings, get the kids ready for school, take them to school, go to work. We do what we do at work. We take the same path to work every day. If we're commuting still, remember when we used to commute, right? Take the same path to work every day. And the reality is it's a pattern. And if, and if you miss your pattern, you feel wrong or something's wrong. And if, and if you're trying to skip the pattern, it's hard. Like you're trying to go to, you're going on your way to work and you're like, oh, I got to swing by the, uh, the drugstore today to pick up the prescription, but you're on your way to work and you realize, oh, I got there and I forgot I was supposed to go to the drugstore. And so uh, without conscious intervention, we end up on the old path. And so as creatures of habit, uh, we have patterns and some of these patterns are working and some of these patterns are not working. And so when we look at our results, it's like the 95% of stuff that we're doing unconsciously every day has a much, much bigger impact on the stuff that we consciously choose to do because those are the, the rules. So if we're thinking about our health, 
the unconscious pattern of our behavior day by day is going to have a much bigger impact on our health than, of course, the specific decision we make on any one day to not have the extra bowl of ice cream or the, the rich dessert or to not veg out the whole day, but to get out there and exercise. So this, what is the standard? If 95% of the time you make the healthy choice and you exercise, then you're going to have a result bottom line of health. If 95% of the time you make the unhealthy choice and as an exception, you do the healthy choice, then bottom line is going to be your result. And it's going to be lack of health. And so it's these patterns that really shape our lives much more than individual choices. And so if we really want to change our lives, we've got to change those patterns of actions, not just, you know, one here and there. And so the question is, how do we change ourselves, which is like changing our habits, our habits of how we do everything, not just how we get to work, but how we interact with defeat or setbacks, right? Do we have a habit of, is our action to go into despair and self-beat up or self-recrimination, or do we get... Uh, reactive and angry, or do we take it in stride, roll with the punches and figure out a new way forward? These are habits as well, and they'll shape our results. When it comes to pursuing a goal, are we unstoppable and bring energy to it and, and resolve? Are we impossible to, to hold back? Or are we easily stopped by any kind of obstacle or things being harder than we thought they would? And if we have a pattern of that in our lives, then it's over time, going to create our results. So everything in our life, the fabric of our life is, is truly the result of this like period, the emergent property of many, many repeated actions. So if we really want to change results in our lives, we have to change our actions. That stands to reason. Uh, but most people repeat the same actions over and over, expecting a different result, which is what the, the Einstein's definition of insanity, right? We're just like, we do the same thing, only bigger, you know, like, expecting it to change, but it doesn't change. It actually makes the situation more entrenched in the way things have always been. So how do we shift our actions? Well, if 95% of our actions are repeated, you know, we got to like figure out how to shift them. So where do they come from? Well, they come from choices, except our, our choice to take that action in whatever that situation is, whether it's the, the journey we're going to work or how we handle hard situations, how we handle defeat, how we pursue our happiness, how we pursue love, how we pursue health, all these things are choices that we're making. Except just like our actions, we're not actually making conscious choices. Usually what's happened is we made a choice in the past. Once upon a time, we made a choice. We, we established a strategy and then we've stuck with it ever since. In fact, they say, and you may have heard this, that we've made most of the choices about who we're gonna be when we're little kids. Like who we are today is who we've been since we is almost as long as we can remember or as long as we can remember, except sometimes there may have been like a dramatic or traumatic event, which caused a big shift up or down. But we made a choice like about how we're going to operate when we were a little kid and we don't even remember these choices. They happened before we we're conscious. You're a little tiny kid. You enter a situation where you're, uh, you know, going to be meeting some strangers, some other little kids that you don't know from before, and you're not sure how to interact. Now, all you know is you've been watching your parents and you saw that mom is shy around strangers. So mom's shy. Dad's kind of shy and awkward around strangers. So you have this understanding that, wow, I'm going to be, you know, you, you approach, approach strangers with uncertainty. That's what I've witnessed as learning as a little kid. And so I go approaching these you know, other children with an uncertainty and then your brain's watching you act and you see yourself act and you're uncertain. You're like, I guess I'm uncertain with strangers and you start to identify with that. And you never remembered choosing to be shy, but you inherited it from watching your parents and then reinforced actions because as human beings, we like to like gather evidence that we're right. It's one of our few primal instincts is to be right and to look good, to be in control and to avoid pain. Those are what we call our primal instincts, right? So you want to you want to look good and you want to be right. And so you're gathering evidence that you're right, even as a two-year-old. It's not like a thought process. It's just what we're doing. And so as a two-year-old, you see yourself being shy. You decide I must be shy. And then let's prove it to myself next time. And the next time you're in action, you, of course, you're in charge. So you choose not to interact and you prove once again, you're shy. So, okay, now we're shy. And 40 years later, we're still shy. We never go back to that original choice and be like, oh, wow, I don't need to be shy, do I? <laughs> like strangers don't actually fight. I could choose differently. 
And so what happens is we make a lot of choices as children. Is the world safe or is it dangerous? Is, is can I trust the process or do I need to be worried about the turnout? Or is the other shoe gonna drop? Do I expect, you know, what are my beliefs about men? What are my beliefs about women? What are my beliefs about love? And we're learning all these things as we're gathering information and we're making our choices for how we're gonna think about these things and what we're gonna do in response to certain experiences. And then we never revisit those ever for the most part until we get into a process of self-examination. Most people late in life. And so our choices have become automatic. And so what this work is about, mindset work is about restoring choice, interrupting the automatic. Say, I don't have to do what I've always done. I'm gonna assert control over myself. And so mindset work allows us to have much greater agency over ourselves. We call this self-management. And so our choices are automatic, but they're very hard to interrupt. If we've been practicing the same choice for 20, 30, 50, 60 years, it's hard to interrupt. I mean, it's hard to interrupt your way to work like we talked about. You can try to make a new choice. Ask anyone who's tried to quit smoking or quit any other habit or try to, you know, trying to quit a relationship that's they're uh, attached to or trying to quit who you thought you were, trying to quit a career identity. It's difficult to leave these things behind because we're attached to them. Why? Because our choices are all driven by our emotions. Our emotions are the source of every choice we ever make. They're a guidance system that leads us through our lives, attracting us towards certain things and away from other things, right? Avoid that pain, avoid that pain and look good. And that's gonna serve me and I want that. And so that's our guidance system. But a lot of us are not in touch with our emotions. We make our emotions wrong. We're afraid of fear. And fear is really actually the most important emotion to, to learn how to manage in a healthy way because fear is not our enemy, but, it, but we can turn it into one if we treat fear as a boogeyman instead of just as a useful guidance system. And so our, our emotions are guiding us away from things that we're afraid of that trigger a fear element and towards things that attract us. And so if we're thinking about our, our health again and our diet choices, we're thinking about you know the unhealthy choice, but it's gonna be delicious and it creates desire and the ice cream or the burger or the French fries, you're like, mm, yum, your mouth and water and just thinking about it. And you're thinking about that uh, impossible burger or the grilled chicken with the lettuce wrap and it just sounds boring and it gives you a different kind of emotion. And sort of like, what are you gonna order? Well, it depends if your emotion is like oh, attracted to the burger and repellent by the, uh, the, the healthy choice, then probably most of the time you choose the burger or you feel and feel bad about it, right? Or, or you, you choose it and then you pay the consequences. Now, other people think about the burger and they're like, they've got a, either a moral commitment or a health commitment to being a vegan. And they're like, oh, that's cruel to animals or that's unhealthy or it's going to make me feel weird and gross later and I want to feel clean and I'm committed to my health. And so they have a different emotion causing them to go towards the chicken or the impossible burger. So it's just, you see how our emotions choose for us. Our emotions choose for us uh, on everything we're doing, actually, even the way we go to work, it's like, it feels wrong if you go down the wrong path, it just feels unfamiliar. And so the edge of our comfort zone of, of the familiar is always fear. It's like, wait a second, that's out of our comfort zone. And the, the edge of our comfort zone is always uncomfortable and discomfort is fear. And fear for most people means stop. So the work we do here in mindset training is, is the purpose of mindset training is to learn emotional intelligence to help us to support us in learning how to manage our emotions because our emotions are driving everything they drive uh, the every one of our choices meaning every one of our actions and ultimately our results are driven by our emotions and there's the automatic emotions we're feeling as we're going through lives our lives and reacting to various experiences and stimuli which are creating choices for us and, and some of this is automatic and then there's also the moments of truth. So there's the way your emotions play out day by day, leading to those 95% automatic actions. And then there's the way your emotions and choices and actions show up in moments of truth. You're about to go into a big sales meeting to make a huge presentation to raise money from investors. You're about to go out on the wrestling mat to wrestle uh, a match or go out on the field to play a, you know, a football game or soccer game. Uh, if you're in sports, right, there's, we hear about athletes using mindset 
to shift their results. And, and what are they doing? They're really using their mindset to shift their emotions. And we all know what it feels like when we're feeling confident, when we're feeling confident and we're trusting ourselves. If you go back to like the sporting event type of analogy, you're like going out there feeling confident and you, you make different choices. You trust yourself. You're in the flow. You're able to get out of your head and get into the experience of what you're up to. And then you create better results. Athletes in flow create better results. Authors in flow create better writing. So you've probably experienced this in your own life. When, when we're not second guessing ourselves, when we're trusting ourselves, when we're filled with confidence, we are able to make you know, different choices, which is to say the choices just flow from us. The writing just flows from us. The words just flow. The, the decisions are coming. We're not stopping to overthink things. And that's an emotional state that's achieved by being fully into what you're doing without second guessing it. So that's what they're doing. They're using their mindset to create their emotions. And so that's how it affects a specific event. How do you shift your emotions for this moment to create something? And then how do you also manage your emotions in general so that 95% of the choices you're making are leading to the results you're wanting? Like you want your health to shift. You've tried dieting 50 times or however many times, and it's a yo-yo. You lose the weight, you gain it back. You lose it, you gain it back. You've been trying to get out of debt or get your business quote over the hump for as long as you can remember. And no matter how hard you try, you can't get it over there. So like, how do you break through the barrier? Even because you can't see yourself, right? We're blind to these things because we're inside them. Like we're the camera can't film itself. We don't see our own operating system. So it's driving all of our emotions. That's important to know since the emotions apparently are driving us, right? So What's driving our emotions? Well, first of all, what happens is we have an experience. The, the emotions that we experience are generated by our thoughts after something occurs. So something occurs and we think about it. We have an impression of it or an interpretation. And that thought creates our emotion. And that emotion creates our choice leading to our actions and our results. So there's a car accident. And you're like, what happened? Was that good or bad? And you're like, well, it's bad. If you were in the car or the car hit you or uh it was your kids driving your car right you're like oh that's upsetting but if if you're a car mechanic your like thought is oh car accident i hope no one got hurt but more work for me right you're neutral on it or positive and so we, we tend to think that things have innate value but really it's like our our thinking about them that creates the value but the the thought creates an emotion you're about to step out onto the field to face your stiffest competitor and if your thought is wow they're ranked higher than i am it's going to be really hard for me to beat them i don't think i can beat them they're just too good i've seen them play before they're just unstoppable can you is there any chance you're going to win that game whatever that game is Probably not, unless you're very lucky, unless they're having an even worse day than you, right? And so your thought then of their, your belief about that is going to shape your emotions and shape your choice. Just like your thought about the burger is going to shape your attraction to the burger or not. You think burger, I got to make a choice and you start fantasizing about the taste and then your beliefs about that burger, your thoughts about that burger are going to really trigger your emotions. Uh, but here's the good news. You're in control of your thoughts. It's not like you can't control them. There's the automatic thoughts that come up. When you look at that burger, when you look at that situation, when you look at that, that matchup on the field, when you look at that competitor at the presentation, when you look at that uh, investor staring you down and you know, you're like, oh gosh, I'm nervous. This person doesn't like me. They don't, they don't they're grilling me. They're uh, you know, making, they don't believe me. They think I'm a farce right now. You're feeling nervous. You start to shake. Your voice starts to, to rock. And then you make weird decisions because your head is scattered. Or you could be like, oh, wow, this person is really grilling me. They must really be interested or they wouldn't be bothering to ask such important questions or such deep questions. This person must really like me because they think I can take it. They're like really challenging me to rise up to my best. The pressure is a privilege. This is exciting. What an opportunity. I would have died for this opportunity to have this a, a, a opportunity to pitch this person five years ago. And here I am, whether I win or lose, man, I got my shot and this won't be my last. Right now, different thoughts, same situation, creating a very different internal experience and very likely a very different result. I'm sure you can imagine. 
So our thoughts create our emotions. Um, and most people are a victim of their automatic thoughts and their automatic emotions. Something bad happens. They're in a bad mood. They got a bad call from the office. Bad call, bad news. And you're like, you know, feel bad. You're angry. Someone says something angry to you. You get angry in response. And I'm not saying I'm part for this because this is how humans are. We, we have an emotional response, our initial reaction when something occurs. Excuse me. So it's like cause and effect. Our emotions are at the effect of things outside of us based on, as we've established, our thoughts about the thing that occurred. And so we're in this constant cause and effect state, which means like I'll be confident after someone gives me proof that I can be confident, <laughs> right? Like uh, but until then, I'm going to lack confidence. I'm going to feel like and act like uh, a loser until I win. And then after I win, then I'll uh, act like a winner. But you know, I'm sure you can also get that going out on the mat, thinking and believing not, you know, that this other person, you can't beat them or believing that you're a loser is going to be even more destructive than thinking that the other person is better than you, right? If you feel and are acting like uh, in a losing mindset, I don't want to say like a loser, because it's just a, it's a mindset that people adopt and they get stuck in. And so are you cultivating that? Because you can control your thoughts, not just let them run rampant. At any moment in time, you can choose to think anything you want. And it doesn't have to be based on something that someone said or did. You don't have to wait for good news to be happy. You can just think the thought, I'm happy, and say it out loud and feel it. And so on the count of three, I want everyone out there to say out loud, I'm happy, and fill yourself up with happiness. One, two, three, I'm happy. And you can just like, you don't need any proof. You don't need someone to say something nice to you. You said it to yourself, and you can just step into it. We know what it feels like to feel happiness. And it doesn't have to be based on something. We know what dignity feels like. So on the count of three, take a deep breath in and fill yourself with dignity. One, two, three. And let out the breath, but hold on to that feeling. And you can fill yourself up with, by thinking it, the, the emotion. If now, if you want to get upset, you can get upset. And there's plenty of reasons to get upset. So part of it's like controlling your thoughts. If, if you want to wallow, and sometimes we do, raise your hand. If you're clear, sometimes we like to wallow. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. It's a normal human thing. It's like, we're feeling it. But my invitation is to wallow, to move through it, not to build it up so that we can be right about it and like get it bigger, but to, to process and move through. But if we want to get sad, we could in an instant. We got it happy a second ago. Right now, I could say, okay, on the count of three, say, I'm sad and allow yourself to feel sad. One, two, three, I'm sad. And there's plenty of things in the world right now, if we wanted to put our attention there, that we could be sad about, which is always the case. And we do want to give those things attention because there are things that are happening that are not okay. And so sadness isn't wrong. It draws our attention to things that are not okay. Things and tragedies in the world that are heavy and dark. There's war, there's shootings, there's, you know, acrimony, right? So where do we want to focus our attention? What are the thoughts we want to entertain moment to moment really shifts our energy. And so let's not stay here, but just, you know, proving that, you know, a minute ago we were happy and now we can be sad. It had nothing to do with anything that happened outside of us, just to do with our thoughts. So on the count of three, let's go happy again. On the count of three, one, two, three, I'm happy. And like, fill yourself up and like, focus on the good things. This is gratitude. Gratitude is focusing on the good things. What's working in my life. And, you know, here's an interesting thing. Gratitude, clinically proven through double blind uh, random assigned studies to be the, the number one, like most effective treatment for depression, right? It's clinically proven and, and it works. It like radically effective tool of just acknowledging what's working in your life. There's a tool called three, three good things. And at the end of the day, what are three good things that happened every day? And it will turn your life around, right? So, so simple because human beings, and this is an important piece of this whole structure there have what we call a negative cognitive bias. So I talk about fear being the most important of the emotions, and that's because fear is the emotion that keeps us alive. We are all the descendants of people who lived, and they lived by being appropriately scared of danger. 
And so the emotion of fear is critically important to staying alive and avoiding pain, which is what fear is, avoid pain. And so given that we have this innate desire to stay alive and not experience pain, anytime we experience pain, our, our mind, our psyche automatically says, let's not do that again. Let's avoid that pain in the future because I don't want to experience that. Next time it could hurt me even worse. Next time it could kill me. It could definitely harm me. If you touch a hot stove one time, it burns you. Next time you look at the hot stove, you don't have to you know, get close to it to remember. You just look at the stove and the stove says danger to you. If you're a person and your first romance of your life, you get betrayed and backstabbed by your you know, first love, it's going to be a lot harder for you to trust romantic partners in the future because you got burned, right? And so uh, there's work to do on ourselves if we want to not become the constant bearer of the pain of all of our past because these things that come up can't, it's not our fault, right? There's an automatic formation of our mindset. Most people's mindset just kind of evolved organically over time. And so the, the mindset, which is at the like root cause of all this, is our collection of beliefs that inform our thoughts. It's like everything we believe about the world, everything that we believe to be so is part of our mindset. And it also includes our attitudes. So what do I mean by everything we believe to be so? I mean, like everything. I mean, what is it? What, what matters? What doesn't matter? Uh, what's true about me? What kind of person am I? Who am I? What matters about me? What are the important things about me? What do I believe? What kind of person do I think I am? Am I a shy person? Am I an introvert or an extrovert is a belief you have about you, right? It's not that it's a label that you've put on yourself. It's something you've decided about yourself, whether or not you're smart or think you're dumb. That's a label. Are you or aren't you? Well, you're a genius for sure, for sure, compared to any other creature. Uh, and, you know, you decide, but you have a belief that may or might not have any relevance or any relationship to how intelligent you actually are. I, some of the smartest people I know don't think they're smart because of things that they believe having nothing to do with how they actually show up. Right. And so, uh, that's a belief, the belief of, are you a strong person or a weak person? Your beliefs about, uh, people are people innately good or innately evil can you trust people or not trust people your beliefs about the universe is the universe a safe place or a dangerous place is it you know looking out for me or is it against me and i'm in a game of survival uh beliefs about men beliefs about women beliefs about young people old people pe beliefs about people who look the same as me beliefs about people who look different than me all these things are beliefs that we use to navigate as our like map of reality what is love how do i find love what kind of, what does a person like me do to get love? Do I deserve love, right? What is success? How does one create success? Where is it located on this map? Now, if the map isn't aligned with the territory, then this is a problem because you're like going to the same spot over and over and over and looking for it there, but it's not actually there, like happiness. Happiness is like a real simple thing. People are like, where's happiness on the map? Where does money come in here? And the, the, the evidence, the data on this is overwhelmingly clear is that money has a rapidly diminishing return on our level of happiness. It matters. And it still, it, it continues to produce more happiness and, and what, you know, satisfaction as it goes up. But there's a law of diminishing returns. And at some point, the sacrifice for it diminishes from so many other possibilities. So happiness comes from relationships. This is also, this is like... Uh, Com, you know, commonly known, uh, but it's, you know, it's like common sense, not so common. And it's proven by every study, right? Is that human beings level of happiness is, is directly proportional to their number and quality of relationships. It's not enough just to have many, though more is, you know, valuable, but to also have relationships that go deep. So I'm just going to clear that out. So it's no longer there, but the, the idea here is that you can, when it comes to shifting our results, which is what this is all about, this is like helping you understand kind of like, okay, my mindset here, my beliefs about the world are ultimately informing a whole bunch of automatic thoughts that I'm not really consciously choosing, but those automatic thoughts have a consequence because I'm thinking them all the time. 
then they're in shaping my emotional experience. And most people's automatic thoughts are more negative than positive, proven by studies. The average American is like two to one. And there's actually, there's a ratio in our general sense of well-being and happiness. It's, it's real easy. There's a mathematical equation. If you have more negative thoughts than positive thoughts, you tend to feel badly about your life. And if you have more positive thoughts than negative thoughts, you, stand, you tend to think positively about your whole thing. But you're totally in control of your thoughts at any moment. Like we showed, you can choose to think what you think. You can choose a different thought. Now, if looking at the latter again, just real quick, you can intervene at any level to change your results. Okay. You can intervene at any, every, any level to change your results. You can intervene at the level of results. Like I can, or at the level of actions, you can change what you do one time and it'll have a very limited effect on your overall picture. But if you change a choice, like change that choice every time, that's going to have a big impact. If every single time you go to a restaurant, you make the healthy choice that one choice is gonna have impact a lot of actions. Now, if you learn to fall in love with a healthy choice, right? Your emotion that you're creating is, I fell in love with a healthy choice by managing my thoughts, then I don't have to make a choice every time. The choice becomes automatic and it's impacting thousands of choices, not just what I eat when I go to the restaurant, but every choice I make every time I eat, as well as how much I exercise. So that uh, approaching things at the level of the emotion has a much bigger impact overall than, at the effect of the result. Also, if we wanna affect things at an even higher level, we go to the thought level, like and start managing our thoughts and consistently thinking positive thoughts intentionally instead of just whatever happens randomly by asserting our own mind control, then we consistently create new emotions, new choices, new actions, new results. And at the highest level, we approach our mindset, which is like really our beliefs. What do I believe that's not serving me? Because some of our beliefs are holding us back. We call that a limiting belief. And some of our beliefs are reinforcing beliefs, right? They're supportive beliefs. Like if I believe I'm powerful, then I make all kinds of new choices and have all kinds of thoughts and emotions because I feel like I'm powerful. And I see all kinds of opportunities available to, available to me. And I take powerful action. If I believe I'm weak and powerless, and that's my mindset, is that I, I believe that then that belief is gonna create a lot of thoughts. I'm not gonna even you know, assume that most things are available to me. I'm not gonna even try to make a difference. I'm not gonna even give it an effort because I can't because I'm powerless. And so then I don't even try. And then that creates the result. And so the, the belief is really at the root cause. And so if you can choose to believe in yourself, which is a choice, it's not the truth, then suddenly everything else ripples and you don't have to pay conscious attention to all every single accident and force yourself to make a different choice if you get to the root cause, which is why we use mindset training, not uh, just focusing on shifting our habits, though you can intervene at that level and there's valuable tools that take advantage of this ladder at every level. And that's the kind of stuff we use at Next Level and this, when Blue Sky Trainings to support companies as well as individuals to shift because in a company, the mindset is equivalent to the culture of the company. So the culture of the company is the things that the company, if it were a person, would be holding true as evidence. You can see it show up in the things the company says about itself in the world and its actions. It shows up in its results every time. And so if you really want to ultimately shift the results of your company, it's like, what's the company culture? Get to the root cause that's informing every decision that comes out of it. It informs who you hire to be in the company. If the company has a clear culture, if there's no clear culture, it's like whoever will take the job. And especially in this day of the great resignation and scarcity of employees, it's easy to take whoever comes. But then that's more trouble than it's worth, honestly. So you want to get the right people. So you want to have clarity based on a clear culture about who belongs and who doesn't belong. And also like what opportunities to pursue, et cetera. So that is how these things relate to your company as well as to your individual results in your life. And so what I want to do now with our remaining time, this is like the ladder. And I'm going to show you a couple simple interventions, mindset interventions that you can use to shift your reality and shift some of the results and your experiences inside of your work lives. So what I want you to do is everyone uh, grab a pen and paper. We're gonna do a little simple journaling exercise. So I'm gonna give you a moment. I'll give you a, a minute to grab a paper and pencil or pen. 
And of course, you can type if you prefer. There's no right way. But most people find it more powerful as an exercise when they use paper. OK. And when you get that paper, what I want you to do is I'm going to have you uh, make a list. And as you make this list, I want you to skip every other line, so leave space between each line. And I want you to start each line with the words I have to. And I want you on that paper, then I'm going to, I'm going to give you a minute, and I want you to write down a list of all the things that you have to do in the coming week or weeks, especially focusing on the things that you don't want to do, because there's always things that we have to do that we don't want to do. There's irksome tasks. Some of these can be like daily tasks that are part of like your everyday life having nothing to do with work, right? They could be like sitting in traffic or um, getting an oil change or taking your kid to school or fighting with your kid about school or doing the dishes or walking your dog and picking up its, you know, poop, right? There's like things that we have to do that we don't necessarily want to do. And there's things we've been, uh, that we have to do coming up that are like specific to the coming week. Maybe there's a report or maybe you have to, uh, have a hard conversation with someone, or it could be stuff that you've been putting off for a long time, like a doctor's visit or a, a big a proposal or whatever. So I want you to start each line with the word I have to, and then just complete the line with what you have to do, stuff from the uh, upcoming week or weeks. And I'll give you uh, about a minute here to get that down and go. And time. All right, now I want you to take that list and look at that list and read the list one after a time, one line at a time. I have to, I have to, I have to, and read your list. And notice how it makes you feel to read your list. If you're like uh, many people, your to-do list makes you feel stressed out. It makes you feel overwhelmed. As you look at it, your heart starts to maybe clench a little or race a little. You start to think about, how you're going to fit all this stuff in. You might start to sweat a little. You might be uh, feeling, you know, a little heat under the collar, okay? Now, I want you to take that same list, and I want you to go through the list, and I want you to scratch out the word, I have to, and I want you to replace it on each line. Scratch it out, and I want you to replace it with the word, I choose to, right? I choose to, and after you've crossed it out on each one of the sentences, I want you to go back, and from the top, read it and like feel it, like own it and say, I choose to take my kid to school. I choose to write that report. I choose to complete my taxes. I choose to take that doctor's appointment. I choose to let that employee go, whatever it is. So take a minute to rewrite your thing. That's why you had to skip line. I choose to and go. and time and so notice if how when you choose to 
for most people, there's a lot, you know, like I choose to feels a lot better, right? You feel more in control, more powerful, less like you're a victim of your calendar. No one likes to do things they have to do. Things we have to do show up like an obligation. We, when we put it on our calendar and say, I have to do this thing, I no longer have any choice. It feels like we're trapped. And when people feel like they're trapped, they want to break out. Though we inadvertently give our power away all the time by saying, I have to do this thing and I have to do this other thing. We don't realize necessarily that in the process of doing that, we're also making ourselves a victim. And then when we make ourselves a victim, we feel bad. It's not a great feeling. It feels horrible. <laughs> we're like, ah, oh, I have no power in my own life. I want to do this thing, but I can't. But you can because you, you chose to put it on there. You could choose to take it off. You're in charge of your calendar. It's there to serve you. You're not there to serve it. It's like a tool of yours. And anything you chose to put on there, you can choose to take off. And all the time, people choose to shift things on us. And, you know, that's okay. Someone's like, hey, you know what? Something came up. I had to shift. And we could shift it. No problem. And so we, we're welcome to ask to shift things. The, the thing is, a lot of us, a lot of times you say, I can't do that because I have to do this other thing. We're using it as a way to get ourselves to cover, our, you know, to make ourselves look good or we don't want to hurt someone's feelings. We're saying, well, I can't. I'm so sorry. I have this other. I got to take my kid to the soccer game, which is something you're excited to do, hopefully. And so now you've made yourself a victim of it. You could just say, I'm sorry. No, I, I could. Right. It's not that I can't. I have no power. I have power. But you're, that's what you're thinking. But you're like, I'm sorry. No, I'm going to my son's soccer game. Right. You don't have to give up your power to let them know that you've already got something else going on. But by shifting our language, we shift the way it feels. But there's an even higher possibility than just owning your power. So I want you to take the same list now and I want you to go back to the top and I want you to cross out the word this time I choose to and this time replace it with the word I get to and then read the list yourself. I get to I get to I get to. And as you're reading it, feel the privilege of what you get to do. There's a good chance that some of the things you put on that list are things that you fought to put there, are things that you went out and grabbed, are things that uh, you would have killed for or died for just a few years ago to have that on your list. And so I want you to go back through and see it all as a blessing. I get to, get to, get to, and read it to yourself and go. And time, and time. So notice how you feel when you start to see your life as a barrel of possibilities as a kid in a candy shop to like see that the things that you get to do are things that not everyone gets to do. And, you know, I hope at this point, you're also clear as you look at this, that a lot of the things that we complain about are very first world problems. In fact, they're first world privileges. Some of the things that we turn into like, you know, big problems for us are like, oh, I have to go take my kid to a, the doctor. And we're in, in a victim mode about the fact that we have to go to the doctor and what happens to the doctor and absent to the incredible gift it is that there's doctors, right? That there's medicine that can cure us, that can help us when we're sick. You know, in, in the fact that not everyone has access to that and that we can afford it or we become a victim of the debt. You know, I have to have this party for my kid and like not everyone has a kid. Not everyone has that, uh, you know, the celebration going on right now. Some people are mourning. Right. And and we tend to focus on what's missing from our lives instead of what we have. And this makes a huge impact on our experience because, you know, gratitude is the number. You know, it's clinically proven. 
number one most effective tool for shifting the human mood is gratitude, focusing on what's working instead of what's not working. And so when we start to see our lives through the lens of what we get to, like where in your business, where in, you know, you're here because you want to grow your business or, and as well as to benefit your own lives, where in your life are you lacking, uh, you know, the gratitude, seeing what you love about the thing and focusing on those aspects of it, because it shifts the energy right away. Because there's always both things that are working and things that are not working in any situation. So this is one example of how we can use our mindset, you know, shift our thoughts, shift our language. The language reveals our mindset. So if we're saying I have to, have to, have to, it's revealing something about our beliefs. We believe we don't have a choice. We believe that it's an obligation. We believe we're trapped. We believe that people won't resist us if we say I have to, right? There's, there's beliefs that are you know, causing us to say those things. And so by saying that, we're revealing that, that belief. However, when we choose something else, when we say, I choose to, or I get to, then we're saying to our brain that I'm choosing, not the past, not what I'm in the habit of choosing. My past isn't choosing for me how I feel about washing the dishes. I choose to wash the dishes. It's okay. I don't need to. I've been doing this a long time. I don't need to be a victim anymore of the dishes. How long have you been a victim of the dishes? Or how long have you been a victim of traffic and letting traffic, you know, take your power or the rain? And I'm not saying this is all easy, like sometimes the rain here in Ohio, right? And it's easy to like, you could be a victim, but it's also like sweet nectar of life. And so we can choose it over and over. It becomes a practice, not necessarily automatic. Remember, 95% is automatic. But how do we form a new automatic? We practice practice, practice. So practice require, you know, requires us to be committed to it, which means, you know, shifting our mindset to be like, you know what, I want to be positive, I choose to be positive. Now, how am I going to roll that out as an actionable item in my life? So it, it's not just a nice thought. If it's just a nice thought, but it doesn't lead to result, you're not really buying it, you're just giving it lip service in your own head. So you've got to really actually go there. And this is for, true for every aspect of our life. If we want to shift our, our health, we have to be not just like shift what we're doing. We have to become a health nut, become interested in health and care about health and care about the food we eat and care about exercise and have that be something that's of interest to us first. If we want to stay healthy, not just have it be an, an event, right? If we want to become wealthy or have abundance in our lives, we could, you know, have that be a shift in our mindset. Winning the lotto, having a lot of money isn't the answer. 90% of the people who win the lotto within five years have the same net worth they did before they won it, only they're less happy because they lost all that money. What's going on there? They didn't shift their mindset. So don't bother shifting the results if you're not going to get to the heart of the matter because it's like moving chairs around on the deck of the Titanic. And so we're going to do one last little mindset trick here where we're going to go deeper, a little deeper and all the way, like we can, we can shift our thoughts. We can shift our way. Here's the thing. The mind cannot tell the difference between something actually experienced and, some, and, and something actually vividly imagined. Let me say that again. The mind cannot tell the difference between something actually experienced and something vividly imagined. So you can practice things in your mind. And you've probably done it before, like a piano scale or a dance move or a speech right? So you can practice in your head and you get better at the same rate as practicing in the real world. In fact, people can practice free throws and get better at the same rate as people practicing free throws in the real world by practicing in their head. You can even grow muscles by imagining yourself lifting weights. That's how powerful it is. So you can practice anything, not just shooting free throws, though. You can also practice feeling confident. You can practice not having the ice cream. You can practice not reacting when someone says something that tags you. You know, there's that trigger that gets you every time. You know what I'm talking about? Well, what would it be like to have that not tag you? Well, you can practice. You can imagine it. You can see it. And by practicing, you get better at it. So I want everyone to close your eyes for a moment and you can just close your eyes and I want you to imagine yourself in your head practicing, see yourself walking on the street filled with a new level of confidence. Maybe you're already a confident, super confident person, probably are, but like just imagine yourself and see yourself being super confident. What does that feel like? Feel it in your body. What does it look like? How might you move differently or interact differently? 
Imagine yourself on a stage, see yourself on a stage. You have fear of public speaking. What would it be like to be on a stage in front of hundreds or thousands of people looking at you, listening to you? If that brings fear, just like feel what it feels like, but fill yourself up, fill yourself up with confidence. Feel what it feels like to stand in front of a room and have be excited to be there. What's your vice? Bring to mind your vice. What's that thing? Your Achilles heel. Maybe it's ice cream. Maybe it's something else. But whatever it is, I want you to imagine yourself in a situation being tempted, mightily tempted. It's right in front of you. And see yourself about to give in to your temptation. And at the last second, this willpower comes up in your heart and you're able to say no. And watch yourself say no and feel the pride, the self-control the strength that accompanies saying no. I want you to imagine yourself a year from now in front of your company. Your company just had a record year, best year they've ever had. And you're giving your company a speech. You're, get, you're giving a talk, inspiring them, sharing the news and getting everyone excited over what you've accomplished in the last year. And open your eyes. So that was just a short taste of this idea here, but I wanted to leave you with this tool because it's one of the more powerful and supportive tools. We just call it the mind shift method, where you can imagine yourself in kind of any situation and you can use your mind to imagine yourself practicing how you want to be in that situation the next time you're there and practice it until it becomes comfortable. And the more realistically you imagine it, the more detailed and emotionally realistically you imagine it, the more effective it will be. And you wanna see yourself in the situation, resisting temptation or breaking through, especially whatever fear factor comes up where you're reestablishing your relationship with that fear and putting it in its place so it doesn't stop you. So that's just another simple tool. We've got dozens more at uh, Next Level and Blue Sky Trainings, simple tools that are designed to support us in inter, you know, interrupting any of the automatic that's occurring in our ladder that's leading to the results in our lives. Some of them are working, some of them that are not working, and it's, it turns out to be pretty straightforward and uh, understood how we can shift what's not working. And this, these tools work, and the, and the best thing about them, I think, is they're extremely simple, they're straightforward, they're not complicated to use, but they are extremely effective if you use them consistently. So uh, that's my presentation for the day, folks. I've uh, appreciated the opportunity to share with you some uh, introduction to mind shift and to mindset trainings. And uh, I look forward to the opportunity to work with you hopefully sometime in the future, supporting your company and taking things to the next level. Thank you everyone so much for joining and thank you, Chris, for such a wonderful presentation. I will be sending out a short survey either today or tomorrow just to get some feedback on this as well as information on SHRM and HRCI credit. Uh, so keep your eyes out for that. Thank you everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Cheers.